Matthew Stadder from Airbus is going to talk to us a little bit about their R&D perspective. Uh, hello there. So yes, um, I'm in charge of uh, technical strategy and R&D for space systems in the UK in Airbus. So what does space systems mean? That's crucial that you understand that. Um, in the Airbus context, that's anything that gets launched and also the um, operations control and the payload control systems on the ground, but not the exploitation of space data. So that's done by uh, another part of our business called Connected Intelligence. So, of course, you know Airbus very well. You probably fly on the, the, the product uh, several times a year now, uh, but you use our space products every day. You've got space connected devices in your pocket. You get your weather forecast. Uh, you use communications, even mobile comms are backhauling through satellite sometimes these days. So, you know, you're using Airbus space products every day in the aircraft products, which is by far the bigger part of the business, uh, only a few times a year. So, um, I just drove here, it only took me 10 minutes from our Portsmouth site. We're very heavily based in Portsmouth, a major space site in Portsmouth, uh, which used to be a Marconi site, by the way, which is why there's a very heavy emphasis on uh, that site on RF engineering, whether it's for communications or synthetic aperture radar imaging systems or microwave sounders, it's all, all using that sort of RF technologies. So um, we share the site with BAE Systems, so I draw, drew, <laughs> drew a line around it so you get, this is the Airbus part of the site, and um, so we've got approximately 1,000 employees working there on telecom satellite payloads mainly. Fun fact, quarter of the world's geostationary telecommunication satellite payloads are built in Portsmouth, a quarter of the world's. That's, there's it for your export from here, okay? Uh, not, not all the comms payloads, because of course, um, LEO, uh, low earth orbit payloads are, are much more numerous and built elsewhere. But these are very large payloads, as you will see later. So in addition, synthetic aperture radar, Novasar, built in the, the payload part built in, Port, in Portsmouth and SSTL integrated onto their satellite uh, platform. Uh, microwave sounder for, for METOP, second generation, is being built there. Uh, it's a very large instrument, very substantial. Uh, I think three of them being built, they will fly on a series of satellites out to 2035. And, and that's a, an instrument that provides, um, the Met Office reckons that kind of data provides up to half of their forecast skill for weather forecasts. Now you might think the Met Office always gets it wrong, but actually forecasts have been improving over the years. Um, and uh, so it's a very important instrument for that. Um, lots of other things going on there, including secure satellite communications, terminals and, and modems for use on the ground. And we're building the next generation uh, UK Milsatcom Skynet 6A at the moment on that side. Uh, larger Airbus um, defence and space, some very big numbers there. I'm not really here to base about how big Airbus is, but um, it, just to put that in context, uh, there's seven countries that we're operating in, uh, 13 sites. And um, let's just come back then to the UK. I've to told you about the Portsmouth site. The other big space system site is in Stevenage, uh, or the big space site. There's about 1,500 employees there. And um, that's the prime site. So uh, where we have a prime contract with the European Space Agency for a satellite or a Mars rover, it's done there. Okay. And there's a new building that's visible here called Orbit House. Ooh, it's a touch screen. Goodness me, that's high tech. <laughs> I won't do that again. Uh, <coughs> there's a building there, Orbit House, recently built 20 million pound investment in the brand new office space. It's a lovely place to go. Uh, Boris Johnson opened it last year, and um, there's the, a very, very clean room here. That uh, building just to the left there is, is um, a bio-clean assembly and integration facility for Mars rovers. So it's cle cleaner than an operating theatre, and, and uh, uh, lots of procedures on, on how that works.
The other sites, I won't go into in so much detail, these are more connected intelligence type sites, so data exploitation. Uh, apart from Guildford, of course, where there is SSTL, which is a subsidiary company wholly owned of, of Airbus Defence and Space. And um, you know SSTL, I don't need to talk about them in, in detail, but uh, they're there in Guildford, along with our geo-intelligence uh, people who, who do the satellite imagery exploitation. Right, so uh, you know, our strap line is uh, we make it fly. I'm not going to talk about the aircraft side of things, but Zephyr is an interesting one. Um, designed and built in Farnborough, um, bought from a, a very small company, the whole concept, uh, developed and invested in over the last five, six years, very heavily, millions of investment money has gone into Zephyr over the last few years, and this year spun out as a UAV company. Uh, separate from, from Airbus, it's completed flight trials in, uh, in Yuma in the US uh, this year and it can loiter for months at a time at 21 kilometres and carry a uh, payload for various different applications. So, um, quite an interesting new capability. So it's close to space. And then a number of satellite examples going further out, uh, all the way out to Rosetta, which managed to land on a comet so successfully it landed twice um, <laughs> out of six billion kilometers. So um, a very wide range of products and you know, Airbus is an amalgamation of, of companies uh, across Europe including UK companies um, from the past coming together to create this space capability in Europe but also in the UK. And in the UK, as I've mentioned already, there's a big emphasis on telecommunications satellites with the mechanical platform being made in Stevenage, so that's the structure and the propulsion system, and the payload being built in Portsmouth, and then the whole being integrated in Toulouse with solar arrays and, and, and so forth. And the antenna design, very importantly, also in, in, in Stevenage. Okay, we work with a lot of suppliers, a number of 2,000 suppliers was mentioned there, and I might come back to sort of the suppliers and working with us in an R&D mode, which is slightly different from being a supplier. So, um, flagship product, Eurostar, NEO, sat geostationary satellite um, for telecommunications. Um, it's always customised to the, to the customer. It isn't a, an off-the-shelf product. Every one is a one-off in a way, because all of our customers want different things. And we're selling it to people like Inmarsat, to um, SES, to Intelsat, to Utelsat, so sat SATCOM operators around the world. And um, very large solar arrays, um, of course, those of you in the know, that's the wrong way around, isn't it? The solar arrays should be up and down, because it's orbiting the Earth, and the solar arrays rotate once a day, facing the sun. And it goes around the earth. Okay, so uh, we always show it that way because it's a landscape, but it's the wrong way around. Anyway, so we've launched 77 of these, built since 1990. We don't build many a year, but they're very big and they're very valuable, and, and this is the, really the core product. In total, now a thousand years of successful operation in orbit and none lost. So those, when they're launched out to geostationary, 36,000 kilometers away, um, they operate continuously for 15 years. You can't send anyone up to repair them. Very, very high reliability. And that record of none lost in orbit is incredibly proud for us and very important. And it affects all the way through, we were talking about supply chain earlier, all the way through to suppliers and how we qualify them and all of that sort of thing. And also change. When we do developments to go on that kind of, of product, you have to be damn sure this is going to be a completely ready, fully qualified development. So that, that really affects a lot of thinking about you know, that product. And it really is the flagship. It's the basis also of the Milsat Com as well. So there's a kind of dual use element. Um, the, the payloads are different, of course, but the, a lot of the technologies are shared. Uh, new SATCOM, again geostationary, but also um, adaptable for medium Earth orbit, one sat, so 
the communication satellite market is, of course, going, in it, going through an enormous change with cord cutting uh, and so forth from, um, uh, uh, from satellite, um, uh, people using fiber, much more for um, video on demand type applications. And, you know, it's commonly said geostationary is dead. Rubbish, nonsense. Geostationary is not dead. It's a very efficient form of communication. Um, Wireless World, 1946. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Stick your hand up if you know what I'm talking about. Ah, did you have one? <laughs> An ex-Airbus employee. <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke wrote this seminal article about geostationary satellite communications in Wireless World 1946, where he talked about you know, three, three satellites you could communicate all around the world. He had the satellites linked one to the other by an inter-satellite link, which has still not been done to this day, but we're about to do that part of it, amazingly. So, you know, um, geostationary telecommunications are the most efficient way of communicating from space to, space to ground. And the LEO mega constellations are very, very, very important, and we can have a conversation about that. But GEO and MEO, Middle Earth Orbit Satellites, are uh, Middle Earth, Medium Earth Orbit, <laughs> talking, um, <laughs> are continuing to be very, very important. So OneSat is our future product, which is very flexible and can adapt to the changes in the market. So it has spot beams that can have different um, patterns, different frequency regimes. It's adaptable um, it, from being a, a broadcast satellite to being a broadband satellite depending on how the operator's market evolves. So a lot of research has gone into the payload and the antennas for that, and I'll come back to that in terms of our big picture here of a few people doing electronic assembly. That's what we do in, uh, in Portsmouth. It's actually much more exciting than that. We're moving to robotized assembly lines, um, so I can't show you that, but uh, uh, that's also a part of it, highly skilled uh, technicians assembling satellites. So give you a, uh, an idea of a size of a one satellite. Here's a, here's a British standard AIT technician down here crouching down. So you can see this is a vast, vast size of, of satellite. Um, that's, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're multi-ton satellites. This is big space, you know, it, it's traditional. It's uh, not new space. It operates, has been operating successfully for decades. Why this focus on SATCOM? I haven't really talked about other applications. Well. Uh, Bryce is a fantastic American uh, uh, company that does space advocacy and research. So that their data shows 400 billion in round terms global space economy in 2021, about a quarter of which is what they call non-satellite industry, so that's the government stuff, so Mars rovers and uh, military satellites and all that kind of stuff. And then the rest of this segment is satellite services, ground equipment, and this tiny little wedge in here. Oh no, excuse me. Touch it again. This tiny little wedge in here is is satellite manufacturing, 13 billion globally, satellite manufacturing. Of the satellite industry services, 118 billion, about another another quarter, that's broken down here. And in terms of communications, consumer communications, 100 billion. Enterprise communications, pro approximately 20 billion, 17 billion. Remote sensing, 2.7 billion. It's a tiny, tiny portion of the current market. Of course, it's going to change. Of course, the market's going to change. But we're focused in our R&D and in, in what we're developing and the products we're developing now on the market as it is today and will be next year and the year after that. Not space-based solar power. We're looking at space-based solar power but we're not doing heavy research and developing new high TRL products for that. We're focusing on where the market is today, and it's SATCOM, very much SATCOM. Anyway, that diagram is so interesting, I could talk about it for ages, but you all fall asleep, so I'll move on. Um, we do have roadmaps and technology strategies, and this is the sanitized version of our roadmap that is for public display. Obviously, we don't want to tell everybody what our strategy is. That's uh, in a commercial setting. That's not a sensible thing to do. But um, it, it, basically, the way these roadmaps are structured is we we look at the markets, we look at 
the trends, so in telecom it's power to match ratio, the bits uh, per euro cost effectively, that's a key performance indicator or figure of merit. Uh, sustainability in design, manufacture, operation, and <coughs> life. Flexibility, I talked about that before, reconfigurability, all of those things are really important. And networked, this is a really big thing. So this roadmap goes from 2022 out to 2032, and in the long term, we're talking about a future where we've got network-centric satellites that are connected between geostationary, uh, medium Earth orbit, low Earth orbit, and of course the terrestrial mobile network. And that all being integrated, what's called convergence. It's always been difficult for us now because SAS comms have been separate from terrestrial comms for a lot of good reasons. It's a big discussion, can't go into that here. But they have really been separated. But with the three GPP mobile standards, uh, recently satellite is completely integrated. Protocols for, for having satellites integrated into mobile terrestrial networks are now written into the standards. And this change is happening. It's going to not happen really, really fast, but it's definitely a trend. And so is also the whole idea of multi-layered communications. So um, geostationary satellite acting, uh, acting as a backhaul communications route for low Earth orbit satellites, for example. So within this roadmap, we have the, uh, the products, so geostationary, um, the Eurostar Neo, the WOMSAT, um, medium Earth orbit, and low Earth orbit developments. And then we have feeding into them building blocks, things like antennas, payloads, and primary components like avionics, propulsion systems, very important propulsion systems for satellite, particularly in geo, um, thermal and power systems, all of that kind of stuff feeding across and into these products. So my focus is very much on, on our plans for these building blocks and putting money into that. We've got similar roadmaps for Earth observation and science and space exploration and on-orbit services, but I'm not going to talk about those now. Coming on to R&D and R&T. In the Airbus world, we distinguish between these two things and um, very often we don't explain that which causes a lot of confusion. So uh, presumably you're familiar with technology readiness levels from one through to nine. One is a sort of uh, back of a beer mat type idea, and uh, by three you've sort of got it in a lab and you've developed something. Uh, by um, five, you're working in a relevant environment. So it's out of the lab environment, you're actually testing it in thermal vacuum chambers and vibrating it and making sure that it will survive in the radiation environment of space and so on. So five is a very interesting point. At six, you've developed the system and you've tested it in the target environment. And eight, you're really very sure that it's flight qualified. Nine, it's flight proven. So R&T is this early phase stuff and R&D there's a bit of an overlap, is really coming in at TRL 4 up to 9. So, very important, these two things. R&T for us, it comes from a separate funding stream internally, and it's focused on technologies. So, if we talk about additive layer manufacturing, the technologies there are the powder constituents, how, the, how you store the powders, how you make the machines work in general, and then when it becomes R&T, it's how do you make an antenna feed horn for a particular product in an additive manufacturing method. And that's very specific to a product line because other parts of Airbus will be looking at how, how do you make structural parts for aircraft but using the same base technology. So there are R&D diverges at that point into different kind of outputs from the core technology. So that's our approach to R&D and R&T. And we do fund internally, I'll come on to that in a moment, but um, externally, uh, a lot of the organisations that Colin has mentioned, European Space Agency is terrifically important for technology development. These are the programmes, if you're not familiar with those uh, acronyms, they are uh, my day job is, is GSTP, TDE, OSIP, and I have other colleagues who are working into the ARTIS Telecom Technology Programme. Uh, obviously, of course, also UK Space Agency for the National Space Innovation Programme, what was the National Space Technology Programme, and I understand that at long last, very soon, there may actually be a new technology call, enabling technology programme. I believe it might even be announced in 
the next day or two. So, so I have been hinted at the IAC. So but there's been a massive gap in the UK Space Agency, as Colin would say, and they've been very busy writing strategies and not actually getting on with it. So, sorry, getting a bit strong there. But uh, they have at last the money and funding for joint developments as well. So we see this as very, very important for magnifying our internal R&D and being able to move more quickly. Sometimes it opens new doors. It enables us to work with other organisations as well because whilst we do have an internal budget in the UK of about 20 million a year for space, that doesn't go out. We are not a funding or a granting body. We spend a lot of that internally and we spend it in on suppliers who are building very specific things that we need for our products. Okay? So this I've put this figure up here. It's it's public knowledge. You can go to the, the accounts of, of Airbus and, and you can see a figure very similar to that that registered at Covenant's house. Actually it's 30, but I'm deducting the stuff that isn't space from that. So the space part is it's very substantial. We work at the moment, and I do a, a tot up every year across the bazaars. And there's 74 upstream space companies that we're working with on technology developments at the moment, on R&D projects. And 29 universities in the UK, including Portsmouth, but many others as well. So the types of things that we're developing, this rather boring boxy diagram with some connecting things, is our next generation SATCOM processor. That is going to bring home the bacon over the next few years. It's called Hyperion. I can't show you very much more about that because it's commercially sensitive. We're putting a lot of money into that at the moment. Very exciting development. Um, this is a hyperspectral imaging breadboard from Glyndor Innovations Limited, a spin out from the University of Wrexham. And we are just starting an airborne demonstration program with them where we will fly a hyperspectral instrument to their design. Uh, and our specification on, uh, on, a, on an aircraft over the next two years with the view to eventually getting that in space as a UK hyperspectral optical instrument for commercial and other uses. Um, the image here comes from DSCL, it's a public image of a, uh, a radar system that the UK MAD is wanting to develop. Uh, we're working with Oxford Space Systems who are developing that five meter antenna that you can see there, deployable antenna, very exciting technology. Um, propellant tank. Uh, we have worked in the past with Cranfield University on wire art additive <coughs> manufacturing to, to form the end caps of that propellant tank. There's a lot to say about propellant tanks, but not now. Propulsion systems, we don't in the UK, in Airbus, make thrusters other people, we buy them from other people, or we also are developing a number of thrusters with universities and UK small businesses. This is a, an example of what we're doing for a structural part with additive layer manufacturing, we're using a material that has been qualified through R&T uh, called scalm alloy, scandium aluminium alloy, um, magnesium alloy, scandium aluminium, magnesium alloy, yeah, so, uh, but we're also using other kinds of alloys and making parts that I can't show you because they are too commercially sensitive, but they look much, much more interesting than that. Uh, additive manufacturing is a fantastic R&D area for us at the moment, and it's really allowing us to develop future fascinating products. Finally, um, a robot arm for in-orbit servicing manufacturing for use on planetary surfaces in a dusty environment. Um, We've been developing that with a drip feed R&D internally in Stevenage for quite a few years now. We've had a bit of money from the UK Space Agency in the past, none recently. Um, so, you know, it's not been a high priority. This is a high priority. That's going to bring in hundreds of millions of business. This is not a high priority for us, but we still want to develop it. Okay, a UK robotic arm for use in space. That's, that's really well developed. We've been working with a company in Cambridge on the inductance encoders. An encoder tells, tell, allows the arm to tell where, where it is in, in its position, what the rotation is. Okay? We've got nerves that allow us to do that. An inductance encoder is, is that kind of system that allows, allows the arm to know where it is. 
And um, encoders come in many different forms. And why we went for inductance encoder is it's contactless and it's solid state. So if you have it in a dusty environment, you're not going to run into problems like you would if you were using a potentiometer encoder or other types of encoder. So we work with a, a company uh, in Cambridge to develop that technology quite a few years ago in uh, you know, a very successful collaboration. So those are some nice examples of some of the R&D activities that have been and are going on. Um, how do you work with Airbus in an <coughs> R&D environment? Well, um, if you've got something interesting that you want to develop that, or that you've got an interesting technology or capability, um, one way we can work is proposing jointly to G ESA GSTP or UK National Space Technology Programmes, things like that. And the Airbus role, if we're interested in that technology, only if, and we're very picky, if we're interested in that technology, what we can do is help you understand how it could be used in space, the space requirement, and we can come in and evaluate your latest development. So we're kind of bookending, that's why the bookends are there. We have a it's kind of bookending role, and the company does the actual development, okay? And we come to an arrangement regarding ownership of intellectual property, which would stay typically with the company. We don't want to steal those ideas, but what we want to do is help companies develop them for our products. So that is really, you know, how the ideal way of us to work with companies. And we go together jointly to get funding. Don't come to us asking for money. We have deep pockets, but they're sewn shut. And, um, you know, uh, that we want to spend the money on our products. And, and that's fair enough. We're, we're a shareholder-owned company. So we're not a charitable organisation. And people do approach us thinking that they can tap us for money. It's, it, no, not really. It doesn't work like that. But work with us. Understand how to work with us, like I've just explained. And we can do great things. So that's it. Thanks for listening. I'll just finish with this because I haven't talked about earth observation. Um, this is biomass. And talking about long times to Gales, Colin, biomass is a fantastic satellite that is going to measure the mass of woody biomass of the planet. It's going to weigh the rainforests and weigh the boreal forests and tell us how much carbon is locked up inside them. It, Hitherto, it has not been possible to do that because using optical remote sensing, you can measure the leaves and you can, you can estimate the green biomass, but the woody biomass, which is locking up most of the carbon, you can't see it. This P-band radar goes through the leaves, bounces off the tree trunks and comes back telling you how thick the tree trunks are, essentially. So, it's an amazing instrument, radar instrument, P-band radar, the principal investigator of that is Professor Sean Quaggan at the University of Sheffield, who I've known for 30 years. And I remember him giving a lecture about how he'd solved the problem of being able to measure biomass about um, 29 years ago, where he was using quad polarisation SAR in order to retrieve this. And then he did airborne trials over Thetford Forest to prove the technology worked. And now, as in a, uh, August 2022, in Stevenage, we integrated this antenna onto the satellite. You can see we've got, again got our standard engineers here. Uh, the satellite is sort of two engineers high, and we're attaching this antenna, we're all folded up, sort of umbrella. And you can see if this is like two engineers high, you can see just how big this antenna is when it's deployed. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you.